Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie. I joined Figma last April, so it's been a little over a year and a half, and I um, run product marketing and brand here at Figma. Um, and I'm gonna be introducing Yuki, um, someone that we actually, fun fact, joined the exact same day at Figma, and it's been such a joy to work with him. Um, and I'll be also managing the Q&A and asking your questions to him. So i um, super excited to introduce Yuki to you all. Um, he is our head of product here at Figma. Um, and but before Figma, he's actually worked on some amazing products that you probably all know and love and use every day, or at least one, at one point used every day. Um, and he's gonna share a little bit about his experience, about um, not just finding product market fit, but what happens after. So Yuki, I'll turn it over to you and we can right. get started. Cool. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. And also thank you to all of you who are tuning in from all over the world. Uh, as Azra said, it's also my favorite part just to see everyone streaming in from uh, different time zones and different parts of the world. So again, thank you. Um, and as Stephanie mentioned, the talk that I want to give today is really about figuring out what to build after achieving product market fit. Um, you know, as a product person, as a designer, you know, you're, you can sometimes be in these, um, uh, in these kind of wonderful situations where your product has actually found product market fit and you need to think about what's next. Um, and I want to draw on some of my own experiences, some stories from Figma to tell you a little bit about how I think about uh, that space. Um, and for those of you who want to follow along, uh, you can also go to my Figma community, figma.com slash at Yuki, uh, and you'll find the deck here. Um, and I often find it fun to just peek ahead and see what this, uh, the talk is about or have it kind of uh, closer just so I can read it at my own pace. So feel free to do that. Um, so with that, I'll start a little bit by uh, talking about myself and my background uh, to motivate why I'm here talking about this. Um, and, you know, in, in the tech industry, a lot of times we talk about going from zero to one, and this story is romanticized. Tech building something from scratch and finding product market fit is really an amazing thing, and that's what you hear a lot about this. But my own career has actually been in this space squarely after it. All of the companies that I've worked on uh, have already found product market fit by the time I've arrived. And I've just more been grappling with what to do after that. So as an example, when I first started out, I actually started at, uh, working on this product, which some of you may find familiar, uh, and that's uh, Hotmail. Um, and, you know, uh, at the time, you know, you can argue that this is a story less about going from one and beyond, but rather from one to zero. But we actually had 400 million active accounts uh, when I was there. Uh, and it was, a, it was a product that had found a lot of product market fit and a lot of different people from around the world were using it. Um, after Hotmail, I uh, moved over to YouTube. And YouTube, as all of you know, is also a product that's loved and used by many. Uh, I had the good fortune of working on uh, this app, the YouTube app on iOS. And at the time, our company had this really audacious goal uh, for 1 billion hours of YouTube to be watched every single day. And it seemed really unachievable at, but at, at the time. But since I've left, the team has actually achieved this goal. So again, you know, this is this company that's been operating at a scale far beyond uh, the zero to one stage. Uh, after that, I uh, went over to Uber. I worked on this app right here, which is the Rider app um, on Uber. And you know, these are some of the, you'll see some similarly large numbers. Um, when I was working there, you know, we had 10 billion trips that were servicing worldwide, nearly 100 million monthly active users. And so this is another company that was uh, operating at you know, an incredible scale. And after Uber, uh, I joined Figma, and Figma, you can argue, is um, you know, the company that's closest to one, um, but nonetheless has found product market fit and is being used by a ton of different amazing companies, as well as a bunch of you on the line here. Um, and you know, the question here has also been about, not about finding product market fit, but thinking about you know, how to scale the product beyond that. 
And one of the things that I've been lucky about is that each of these different companies, uh, I was, you know, we had a leader that was really interested in doing more than just taking the product from one to two. Uh, they didn't want to be iterative. They had much bigger ambitions. At YouTube, it wasn't enough just to build a really successful video platform. And the company really wanted to fundamentally disrupt cable. And at Uber, it wasn't just enough to displace car ownership. Uh, we really wanted to become the logistics platform for entire cities um, to move things, people, everything around. And then at Figma, we've been making a tool uh, for design, but what we really want to do is make design accessible to everyone and anyone. So these are kind of the ambitions uh, that I had the fortune of working, uh, working with. And this is what this talk is about. It's about that stage after zero to one, and I call it one to 10, uh, just to give a sense of that scale. Um, and this, this talk is about figuring out, navigating the space, how to help your product go uh, from one to 10. And to be more specific about who this talk is for, um, it should be for people who are working on a product whose business is doing quite well, and that's not something that uh, you're currently worried about. Uh, that your product is loved by many, and uh, you know many of you on the line have uh, have tweeted and posted on social media so a lot of really wonderful things about our product. My favorite one is the kind of bottom one, right one, where someone has actually projected Figma on their Tesla screen. Uh, which is a classic Silicon Valley thing to do. Uh, it seems like they're parked, so uh, hopefully, you know, they're using it in a safe way, but it's kind of hilarious. And this just, you know, speaks to how much people uh, really love Figma, which is really, you know, humbling. Um, but the other requirement is that your product has to be bursting at the seams a little bit. You know, uh, this is the Uber app that I arrived to when I first uh, got to Uber. And if you look at the bottom here, these are all the different products that, uh, that Uber offered at the time. And I believe the, the location here is set to somewhere in Chicago. Um, and this is a real screenshot, literally crammed all these different products in the screen. And we couldn't do, uh, we couldn't scale much beyond that with this current design. So, you know, definitely bursting at the seams. Um, and also, you know, your users just have to be asking for more. Um, and all of you do a wonderful job of letting us know all the feedback that you have. Um, and it really should feel a little bit like this, where there's so much customer feedback and you're trying to figure out which ones to act on to figure out which ideas to build and which ones you, know, you actually have to say no to. And the simplified version of this diagram is this. And this is the foundation of today's talk. Uh, I really wanna talk about uh, the first step here, which is, how do you decide what feedback is important in the first place? There's so much people are talking about in terms of you know, ideas or problems they have. How do you actually decide which of these to act on? The second thing is having decided what's important, how do you actually get all these good ideas built? And the reality probably is that there are too many things to build even then. And so how do you, what are some strategies for working through that? And then finally, the hardest part, how do you actually say no? Chances are, if so many people are asking for so many different things, you actually have to say no a lot. And what are some ways to think about that? So I just want to give you some practical tips for each of these areas. I want to start with how you decide what feedback is important in the first place. And it's really tempting to hope and believe that there's just a magic prioritization formula that you can use something like rice here, reach, impact, confidence over effort to decide which of these feedback, which of these uh, feature ideas to act on. And while this is a really neat formula and, and does speak to generally how you think about thing, these things, uh, it's never the case that it's this easy because each of these things are really hard to measure in the first place. Um, and the way I think about it is kind of, uh, I've, I've kind of unfolded in a series of uh, tips here and the first tip I have around this is just first and foremost to step back and make sure that you've sought out all the feedback that's unheard. And I was recently reminded of this uh, when I was actually trying to file a support ticket on the Uber app. Um, and, you know, this is obviously also my fault because I had a part in designing it this way. Um, but I just realized how many taps it actually takes to get to a point where I can enter some custom feedback about a problem that I had. 
Um, and this is a really healthy reminder that actually most customers aren't going to take the time to go through all of this. Um, and you know, the idea that you know, for every piece of feedback a user gives you, there probably exists a hundred more that were never shared. Right? A lot of people don't go through the effort of finding a way to provide a, a lengthy kind of, but uh, a feature request on through support or to tweet at you. You know, those things take a lot of energy and time. And so, you know, one of the most important things is figuring out how do we know that all the feedback that we're acting on is, you know, is, is balanced. And this is something that we thought about uh, at Uber when we were working on the driver app um, redesign. And the backdrop for this was that, you know, Uber was going through a little bit of a difficult time. We had lost some trust uh, with our drivers and we embarked on this can campaign, 180 days of change uh, to really, uh, fundamentally change our relationship with drivers and as part of that we really wanted to figure out you know and go out and get all the feedback that we possibly can and not just the ones that we've been hearing to date and some of the things we did was just establish completely new ways to retrieve feedback so for example uh, we actually brought drivers over for for lunch and brought them in groups um, and one of the important things about this and this this might just seem kind of like a you know funny silly thing to do um, but one of the things that we found was that when people in, like drivers, um, users were brought into group, brought in as groups, uh, they started saying things like, hey, you had that issue too. I thought it was totally my fault. And it was kind of this interesting phenomenon where, you know, drivers, when they were encountering issues in their app, had just assumed that a lot of it was just their own fault and didn't really uh, think about it as the product's problem. But when they saw that other drivers are having similar issues, uh, they, you know, they started to realize that these are problems that Uber had rather than their own. And this is a really valuable moment for us because a lot of our interactions with our users to date have been one-on-one -on -one in this way. Uh, another one is just meeting users where they are and when they're using their, your product. And so we did a lot of things to just you know, actually be in the car observing drivers driving. Um, and, you know, this is really important because a lot of times when people are using your product, they kind of encounter these things that they themselves can't necessarily explain or take the time to just note down and tell you about later. And it's really important to be able to observe them in the moment in situ. And one of the important learnings that we had here when we were doing this uh, back at Uber was uh, this kind of counterintuitive idea that drivers actually prefer an app crash over an app freeze. And the reason for this was that, you know, if an app crashes as the driver, your hands are on the steering wheel and all you have to do is relaunch the app because the app is killed. If the app freezes, you actually have to reach over, force quit and kill the app and then relaunch it again. And it takes a lot more effort and time. And so this was one of those pieces of feedback that we never would have really gotten if we had just been reading the feedback that people had been sending us organically. And it was something that fundamentally changed some of the success metrics that our platform team had, where they started focusing a little bit more on uh, freeze rates rather than crash rates, which is the more common thing to go after. Um, and you know, another example of a, a different channel we set up was making sure that uh, we were on WhatsApp threads with some drivers. And this is a really, really interesting phenomenon too, where people felt that you know they had an employee that they could just casually reach out to, send some screenshots to, and we could kind of clarify in the moment. And we can do it whenever you know the driver is uh, feels like doing it, and it feels uh, it feels really easy to give feedback. And this is another example of us just setting up another forum where we could get the kind of feedback that we wouldn't otherwise from uh, social media tickets and and other kind of more formal channels. So that was a little bit about kind of what we did at Uber and our effort to go out and get feedback, um, feedback from channels that we wouldn't otherwise have, uh, have discovered. Uh, my sub second tip around this is, you know, in terms of figuring out what's really important to pay special attention to users' product hacks. So I think users are often telling you about some of the problems that they have, but the most powerful way that they, they can indicate that they need something is to actually work around it. It's so important to them that they've just found some kind of workaround, some kind of product hack uh, to solve their problem. And that's usually a really good source and signal to know that something's really important to address. 
So a really simple example at Figma uh, is file thumbnails. So as many of you know, uh, at some point last year, the way things worked was, you know, you know, file thumbnails really basically looked like this. And the problem is a file thumbnail like this, and this is the th file thumbnail for this talk, is, is really not that informative. You can see the structure of the file, but you can't actually see what the designs are like. And maybe if you're in the file browser, you don't actually, you know, know if the file is, this is a file that you really want. And so one of the hacks that we started seeing users do, and again, this is the, this is the thumbnail, is uh, something that looks like this. So uh, maybe I'll go back to this first. So the way our thumbnails worked was we just took the first page uh, and fit all the frames, all the artboards in, you know, in, a, in a screenshot and made that the thumbnail. Uh, but what users started to do was actually make their first page not the actual design file, but a dedicated cover page and make that a much smaller graphic so that when we actually use that way, uh, that algorithm to generate a thumbnail from the first page, we would just grab you know this particular frame rather than everything else. And this is kind of an inconvenient setup because for most people, you know, people land on page one and have to know that there's another page two to go to. So this was kind of this interesting workaround that we saw for people to get the kind of cover photos and thumbnails that they really wanted and found useful. And we realized that you know it's something that we should probably be actually productizing, and we did. Um, and you know, I think it was some point last year in September uh, we launched this feature where you can right-click and generate and make any 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 frame uh, a thumbnail. Another more substantial example is this one. Um, there is a des designer up in Seattle called uh, Jackie and some of his friends at Microsoft. Uh, and during nights and weekends, they built this platform called Figma Plus, which is this unofficial plugin system for Figma. And at the time, we didn't have plugins. Um, and this group was really so passionate and felt that it was really necessary to build plugins that they had basically hacked Figma to allow for this to happen. And things like content generation, um, you know, uh, adding icons, all sorts of automations, they built an entire platform for that. Um, and this is another example of a hack that users are doing and they felt so passionate, passionately about. Um, and, you know, over time, we also decided that this is something that was necessary. And we had the good fortune of just partnering with Jackie uh, and really showcasing some of his work and when we launched the official plugin system as well. So again, this is an example of taking a hack and actually productizing it uh, because the hack really spoke to the needs of a customer. And the third tip of here is to really make sure that we translate feature requests to problem, but also problems, but also recognize features as currency. So this is kind of like PM 101, but you know, when, uh, when someone gives you a feature request, you, know, you want to always make sure that you back out the actual user problem. And the reason for doing this is that it may very well be that there's a better solution to that problem than the given feature request. Right. Every feature request has a problem. The problem has many solutions, and it's really healthy to be able to look across the possible solutions to decide which one to actually go after. Um, so you know, this is something that's really important as you're distilling all the feedback that you're getting to make sure that you're operating on problems rather than feature requests. Um, but at the same time, it is worth noting um, that people do use features as currency when they're comparing different products. Um, and so it's you know, it's, it's a good balance. Um, I think at the end of the day, users don't give you credit for having found the right problem. They still want to make sure, uh, want to, you to build a solution uh, that resonates with them and that they can talk about uh, and they can use to compare. So it's really important to consider that piece as well. And the last feedback in this particular area is just to remember that user feedback isn't the only input. And when I think about strategy, I think the most important input into strategy is insights. Um, you know, you first collect the insights and then derive a strategy. And this is the framework I use to think about the types of insights that you can have. Uh, you can have customer insights, business insights, and macro environment insights. And you know, customer insights include the needs of existing users, and that's all the feedback that you're getting today. But there's also the needs of prospective users who you're probably not hearing from. And there's also behaviors that you see uh, users taking in your data uh, that you may not be hearing about in the feedback. 
So all of those comprise of insights that you might want to act on in terms of you know, the customer. But there are also other things too, the business insights, revenue opportunities, growth levers and cost drivers, or the macro environment stuff like the industry trends or what your competitors are doing. So all of these insights are what help you decide what to do and what to build. And you know, it's just important to remember that you know, user needs is definitely a really important part of it, but one part of the picture. So hopefully that gives you a, a little bit more of a sense of how I at least think about you know, processing all those different feature requests and ideas that you get from users and trying to decide what's important and what some of the most important considerations are for it. But after having gone through the process, you still probably end up concluding that there's a lot of things that you want to build, right? Um, and naturally this is true because there's just you know, so many customers, so many various needs. And so the next series of tips I'm going to give you are about how to think about um, you know, how, to, how to solve that problem and creatively solve that problem so you can build more with less. And the first thing is to just remember that code isn't the only way to build. And this is something that I learned uh, when I was at Uber. Um, and Uber is a tech company, but it also has a world-class ops organization. And from the ops team's perspective, uh, they see their tools for building product as SQL queries and emails. Um, when I was working on uh, Uber Pool, we had this idea that maybe it would make everything more efficient if we could get people to walk to main corridors within a city. Um, and so that, you know, as cars are driving along these corridors or avenues, they can just pick up people along just like a bus. And you don't have to make all these detours into small streets to pick up everyone along the way. And as the product team was really thinking through how we would build this, what are some of the algorithms for matching, what are the experiences that we would actually build, the ops team just had this idea of let's just send an email and tell them that they can get a faster pickup if they actually go to, uh, to one of these corridors. Right? And this isn't really building a real product, but it definitely allowed us to vet the idea that people were actually willing to walk in the first place. Um, and of course, over time, we actually productized that uh, in, in this way inside of the app. Um, and this isn't necessarily kind of building the product. Sending email isn't necessarily building a product, but it definitely allowed us to validate and adjust some of the ideas really quickly so we could get to a high confidence product really, uh, as fast as possible. Uh, another example was this one where we also had this other hypothesis that um, people riding Uber X, which is our product for um, that wasn't a shared ride, would actually be willing to share a ride with a stranger if they were guaranteed that they were the last one in and the first one out. And so for those of you who are uh, familiar with computer science, we call that LIFO, last in, first out. But this idea that if we can guarantee that there is no there's no detour, maybe people will be willing to share the car with someone else. If they can share the car, that's really great for our ecosystem because it's much more efficient. And so one of the things that we are figuring out is how to build this experience. But this is another example of you know, using the, an ops team coming and say, why can't we just ask the question of whether they're willing to share a ride? And if they hit yes, then what we'll do is we'll give them the discount um, after the fact. So we'll just go ahead and say, send the same Uber X car anyway, um, so that they'll get the ride to themselves. But later that night, we'll just run a SQL query and figure out which of the people had said yes, and then give them a refund for $3. And this is a really quick way for us to validate that, you know, this idea even worked, that people were willing to do this. Um, and to even measure kind of like the elasticity, just figure out how much we had to pay them to actually get them to do this so that we can actually productize the, uh, the feature later. So those are some of the lessons I learned to maybe look beyond uh, what you're actually building inside the product to see if there are ways that you can shortcut to the better, a better solution faster. The second is, you know, it's not just SQL queries and, um, and emails, your users can build for you too. And what I mean by this is at Figma, you know, we continue to have feature requests around uh, things like bullet point lists or spell check. And, you know, as someone working on product here, it is, you know, it is kind of embarrassing that we don't have these features today. But when we think about all the things that we need to build, at, build on, you know, this never ends up being the highest priority. 
Um, and one of the things we endeavored to do was make sure that we can provide a platform that people can build some of these features for us or the features that they care about. And you know, that was the genesis for uh, our, our plugins. Um, and you know, one of the biggest requirements of the plugins was just that you know we can make it so that anyone who can code a web page with basic HTML and JavaScript can build a Figma plugin. And when we released this platform, you know, sure enough, people built bullet point lists, people built spell checker as, pl uh, as plugins. Um, and you know, this is a really interesting way for us to, in some ways, crowdsource feature development. Obviously, over time, like all of these features are things that we want to build. But at the same time, there will always be interesting use cases that we'll never build ourselves. So a good, really good example is this one, Mapsicle, uh, which is a favorite plugin of mine, especially because I can see how useful it would be for a designer, say, at Uber, to just really grab a rectangle and insert a map really quickly. Um, but this is not something that makes sense as a feature that we would build uh, for in, within Figma natively. Um, and that's why, you know, this plugin ecosystem is, is really powerful because it enables people to kind of build their features that are useful for them, uh, even if they're, uh, if they're not common use cases. And, you know, to date, we have a really healthy ecosystem of a bunch of different plugins. And, you know, uh, it's kind of our way for uh, our users to help us uh, with some of our feature development, which has been really nice. So it's not just your users, your competitors can build for you too. And this is kind of provocatively stated here. Um, but this is something I learned a lot at Uber. Um, and one of the things that we were constantly doing was just checking out what Lyft was building and seeing how they landed. And you know, when you think about competition, uh, it's it's always, you know, we we're often told to think about competition as something that's that's good and that, you know, uh, you know, it, it makes all of us better. And while we all believe that, it's kind of hard to embrace that in the day to day. But if you actually conceptualize your competitor as another R&D arm that can run experiments for you, then I think it's actually is a really liberating way to think. So for example, at, uh, at Uber, you know, oftentimes Lyft was ahead of us in, in shipping certain features like scheduled rides or monthly subscriptions. Um, but one of the wonderful things was we got to see how it worked and how, what adjustments they made to their, uh, their product after they launched to know what are the things that we should be thinking about as we build our own product. And Uber uh, lifted the same for, as well. You know, we were, we were uh, trying to figure out kind of things like how can we suggest better pickup points or, you know, how can we test these bus style uh, routes? And those are things that uh, Lyft you know, Lyft learned from and, uh, and implemented later as well. And one of the most interesting things was not the things that we respectively decided to build, but the things that we respectively launched as ex experiments, but never rolled out. And one of the things that Uber we did was see what experiments Lyft was running um, and which ones kind of disappeared really quietly after a month or two. And that was a good signal for us to use too, to give us some signal that maybe some of the ideas that similar ideas that we had wouldn't work. Or we'd have to rethink some of those things. And again, this isn't a case of, you know, the competitor literally building a product for you, but it is a case of how you can fast forward through some of the validation and to, you know, really be observing what the ecosystem is doing uh, to do that. So that was a little bit about you know, some tips on how to think about, you know, um, getting more things built faster and validating some of those things faster. And the last thing I want to talk about is, you know, how to say no. And this is arguably the hardest part. You know, if you're a successful product with product market fit, chances are 90% of the time you're having to say no because you certainly, you just simply don't have the team uh, to build all the things that your users want, even if you think that it's valid. And, you know, as you know, I'm Japanese um, and as someone who's Japanese, uh, I find it particularly hard to say no. Uh, and this is a, a book that Shintaro Ishihara wrote, who is the governor of Japan, who recognized that, you know, how difficult it was for Japanese people to say no, that he, you know, he titled this book, The Japan That Can Say No, a rallying cry for the nation to actually kind of learn how to say no. Um, and so I can empathize with the idea of how difficult it is to actually say no to your customers. Um, another funny thing about Japanese is that you know, we have this phrase in, uh, 
in, in a business context, Maimukini Kento Shimas, which uh, in English roughly translates to we will optimistically consider this, which sounds really positive, uh, but in reality means sorry, no. Uh, and this is kind of portrays how difficult it can be uh, to, to say no, uh, at least in something that's kind of even codified in our language. And my advice here isn't necessarily to say, you know, we'll optimistically consider this for future requests that come your way. Um, so I want to give you some concrete tips on how to do that. And my tip here is just not to be afraid to share your process sometimes because this can actually really help. Um, and when you think about how you treat your customers and how you can respond to a feature request where you have to say no, there are a couple of different ways in which you can respond. You can respond by saying something like, hey, sorry, only 0.01% of your customers have this problem, so we're not gonna fix this right now. And while this is sound PM thinking, um, at the end of the day, the customer feels like a stat, right? They've been reduced to a stat and their problem is still important to them regardless of this, this statistic. And so you make them feel really terrible. The opposite of them is to treat the customer as a king, and that's a phrase that's used, customer as king, where you say, hey, that's a really brilliant idea. We'll go implement it right away. But the reality is that you can't actually do this all the time, and you're going to be over-promising things. And so over time, you're going to erode trust here as well, um, because you're not going to be able to deliver on this. So what I think is the right thing to do conceptually is to treat your customer as an equal and to pretend that they're, um, you know, they're a coworker, for instance, and you're just kind of trying to explain to them why you're making certain decisions and to, you know, to be open up your thinking a little bit and also be willing to get some feedback on that. Um, and we do this all the time, actually, at Figma. Um, as many of you know, we share a lot of our process and inside look into how things are built. And this actually helps build a lot of empathy uh, because people understand that, you know, even the smallest of features are quite a bit more complex. And, you know, I recommend you also read our latest one on Spread Shadows, uh, which seems like a really simple feature, but in practice, uh, there are a lot of details to figure out. And this is an example of treating a customer as an equal because they can really understand what it's like to actually build this thing. And immediately you win over some empathy. And similarly, you know, uh, show on the product team, uh, you know, at some point earlier this year had opened up a little bit about, you know, how we actually decide to uh, build product and what a process looks like. And this is a really well received tweet as well. And the reason for that is it really humanizes the team. And again, it really very much feels like the customer is brought along for the journey and they have a really good sense of what the team is about. And, you know, uh, this can kind of manifest also in customer conversations. And this is probably the hardest forum in which, you know, to say no. But imagine kind of a sales meeting, for example, or a meeting with an important customer where uh, your customer is asking you, you know, when are you building feature X? And the bad version of it could look like this, where, you know, you keep on responding by saying, hey, we're not prioritizing at the moment, but we'll put it on your backlog, right? Something that, you know, if you've worked with PMs, PMs say this a lot. But the problem with that approach is you're just going to start to feel repetitive and robotic. Um, because you're going to kind of have to continue to re respond to that, uh, to request feature requests in that way. So a slightly better version of this might look like this, where, you know, uh, you might, when someone asks you for feature X, you know, you use tip number two, I believe, which is to try to really figure out the problem. So you say, interesting, tell me a bit more about why you want that feature so that you understand where they're coming from. But at the very end, you still end up saying, you know, that's super helpful context. I understand your problem, but we're not prioritizing at the moment. And we'll put it on our backlog. And so while the customer feels a little bit better that you've actually kind of, you know, internalized that problem and understand where they're coming from, they still don't feel really great because they they don't feel like you're actually going to get around to this anytime soon. So I feel the best approach is actually something that looks like this, where you know, if someone's asking about building feature X, you're pretty upfront with them and say, we're not planning to build that right now, but let me share our priorities and framework and would love to feed your feedback on it. And I've been really surprised when you know, I explain why we're not working on it because we're working on these other things and invite them, for, uh, invite them to give feedback on whether that prioritization feels right. A lot of times customers come back and say, oh yeah, I see. Yeah, definitely prioritize that other stuff first, and then we can talk about our feature X later. And you know, this is a moment of 
building a little bit of trust where you know they start to trust kind of the product decision making process and you know the worst case is that they don't you know they don't agree with that prioritization but that's exactly the kind of feedback that you want right instead of talking about individual features you want to understand if your customers are generally misaligned with the way you make prioritization decisions um, because that's really good information to have and the meta level takeaway for this is something like this where really what you want to up level the conversation from individual features to the philosophy to the prioritization framework right you could end up in this endless feature battle is like very uh you know endless conversations about feature a b c or d but instead it's much more healthy to actually engage with your customers about the philosophy and the prioritization framework um, because you know it's a much more scalable way and it also builds trust uh around you know uh it really builds trust and the way i think about this too is that you know oftentimes uh, a company is choosing a product not just because of its feature set but because of its vision and its philosophy and if they can believe that you're headed in the right direction they can actually uh you know they can tolerate some of these feature shortages because they know that you're thinking about this problem the right way so that was my talk a little bit about how you decide what feedback is important in the first place how tips and tricks for how to get some of those ideas built as fast as possible and then ways to say no, which is the most difficult part. Um, and as I said, you know, this talk is available online in the Figma community. Feel free to take a look at the deck or remix it, um, use any of the content. Um, and I, at this point, I would love to take any questions that you have. Awesome. Thanks so much, Yuki. Um, we got a, a couple questions actually around prioritization. So from Juan Carlos, Kuya and Ruben. Um, so I might just combine those since I think they're a little similar. Um, so question around like, how do you manage to prioritize at an epic level? And if there are any um, specific uh, examples you can provide about the magic prioritization formula or any sort of tips and best practices. Um, yeah, I think this yeah, yeah, yeah. is mine for a so, lot of time here. Yeah, um, I think, I think the ethos of this question is, you know, how do you how do you even prioritize at the level of not just features, but you know, user stories that you want to enable, um, and you know, how to think about that. And let me know if that's not the gist of the question. I'm happy to talk about something else. Um, but you know, I say a lot of questions about kind of how how to take the insights into strategy. And at the end of the day, I think that you know, you know, when you take all the insights that you have, they still get distilled down to a set of goals that you're going to work uh, operate on, and it's the goals that are the ones that are are they helping decide which of the you know which of these epics and user stories to go after. So in in some ways, it's an exercise of like making sure that you can define goals really really well. Um, and I think some of these goals are, um, I think maybe maybe kind of like the gist of this question is that. Um, you know, there's there's many layers of uh, you can you can decide um, which feature to build um, based on. Right, let me start over. Um, I think that just to this problem, the, this question is kind of like not just like given a problem, which particular features to build, but how to decide which problems to solve in the first place. And it's definitely true that, uh, you know, a bunch of va valid problems are out there. Uh, and sometimes it's difficult to choose which particular ones because they all seem pressing. And I think that's where it comes back to goals, where maybe there's this particular market or audience that you really need to strategically go after uh, maybe this quarter or this year. And that's why some of these user problems are more important. Or maybe there's kind of a competitive angle where you realize that there are certain certain parts of the audience that you're losing because you're not addressing those problems. So that's where it comes back to kind of these other considerations and not just user feedback, um, but things like, you know, strategic, um, you know, macro environment stuff or the needs of your business. Um, and that's, that's how I kind of start to think about it. Um, yeah. But let me know if that's helpful. Awesome. Um, Enrique had a question about, you know, when do you feel confident enough to turn an experiment um, into an actual feature into a product? 
Mm. Yeah, I think, um, well, the first thing is, it's really important before you run an experiment to do that thought experiment ahead of time. And one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, Saba on my team who uh, leads the growth team has started to do is to write out these decision trees and kind of do a pre-mortem upfront, basically. Um, you know, you pretend like an experiment comes back in A, B, C ways, what would you actually do so that you can kind of commit and not be in a situation where you're in the middle of running an experiment and trying to decide that in the first place. Um, so that's number one. I think, you know, it kind of comes down to the success metrics. There are different kinds of experiments. There are experiments where you're trying to figure out if there are negative side effects, but otherwise you want to roll it out because of all the things that it enables for the future. Um, or there are experiments where you're doing it because there are some other reason other than the business metrics that you're trying to move. Um, and, uh, you know, what you want to make sure of is, you know, that you're, you're not introducing these other effects that you wouldn't otherwise have thought about. Um, so I think it's very much case by case, um, and it's a question of goals again, but um, I think a healthy thing to do is just to kind of debate some of those uh, situations and scenarios up front. Um, and then, you know, you'll, you'll know. And if I think an important part of the exercise is actually realizing that sometimes people resort to experiments to just kind of like um, advance a uh, kick punt on having a really hard conversation. And if you can up, up front identify that even if an experiment comes back in a certain way, you still won't be in agreement of whether to roll it out. And that's something that you need to address up front. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are definitely interesting debate conversations. Um, a question around, this is a good one from Carl. How do you prioritize the highest paying demanding customer, especially when they ask for specific special features. Um, and of course that can potentially yeah. lead to scope creep, spaghetti codes. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's always hard. Um, you're always going to have some really influential customers. And I think, you know, as, as someone working on product, you're confronted with questions around, do you do something really special for them? Um, even if it's something that, you know, other customers can't benefit from. So I think that, uh, you know, the way I think about it is number one, you know, just making sure that you think about whether something can be generalized for uh, other customers or other prospective customers. And uh, sometimes the way I think about some of our the power user customers that we have um, and some of like the bigger companies is um, it may be the case that they're the only ones who need it today, but they may be really advanced today and maybe representing the future of where everyone will be in a couple of years. And so for, if there's a reason like that, it's really compelling to think about, uh, uh, about responding to some of those feature requests just because they're advanced. Um, but if you don't really see a strong line of sight to other customers needing it, then you do definitely have to be thoughtful. Um, and you know, I think that's where it's, it's helpful to have as much as possible an open conversation. Um, and even at Figma, uh, I think it's, it's interesting for us to kind of pose that question back to customers of, okay, what are other use cases that you might, in, you might imagine that are useful for the thing that you're asking for? Uh, because, you know, help us make a case internally for doing this as well and try to have some of those conversations. But yeah, definitely a difficult uh, situation to be in sometimes. Um, but, you know, you have to have a little bit of conviction um, to, you know, to know that it's something that's not just one off. Yeah. Along a similar vein, um, um, Alex comments, uh, uh, it's a really nice approach to saying no to features, but ha do you have the same approach when it comes to requests from stakeholders like the CEO? Yeah, actually, absolutely. Yes. Um, I think uh, a really a really good example is when I was working at Uber, our CEO at the time, uh, Travis, uh, sent me texts about all the problems that he had with the Rider app all the time. And uh, it was very difficult for my team not to drop everything and just work on it. Um, because, you know, like you feel really obligated to respond, right? Um, but over time, I quickly realized that that wasn't sustainable. And um, I really had to kind of like come up with a framework for uh, describing the kinds of problems that he's having and then uh, bucketizing them in certain kinds of problems and then kind of like pointing it back to, to him and to say, hey, actually, you know, your problem is of type X. 
um, uh, that we're solving. But actually right now we're focused on type Y because it's the more pressing problem because it's leading to say more cancellations. Um, if you agree with that, we're gonna focus on that and we'll get to your problem next. And uh, surprisingly pretty receptive to that kind of thing because you know, again, that was a case of up leveling the conversation. Um, otherwise, you'll always be fighting these individual battles and you'll, people will feel like you're not really listening to them. Yeah. Um, here's a question from Chin Chun. Um, uh, it actually relates to the earlier, one of your earlier slides around different companies' philosophies and YouTube's um, uh, vision around disrupting cable. Yeah. Um, curious about like, what's an example of this specifically like coming to life in the work and then where did this philosophy come from? I see. I think that, um, you know, I think that with, with, in the case of YouTube, um, I think it was important because it made us think about one, who our competitors are and what people are, you know, are, are comparing us against. And it helps us kind of like, you know, make sure that we're looking at the right kind of categories when we're making those comparisons and evaluating the experience. And so when you think about kind of like the, the experience of watching cable TV, it does feel different from like the early days of YouTube where people were watching short video clips um, and were navigating and browsing content in a different way. And you start to realize that, oh, there are certain basic things that are missing. Like, okay, what does it look like to sit down with YouTube uh, in the evening to figure out what a movie to watch? And those kind of like use cases uh, don't seem as strong um, when you're thinking about kind of like, uh, you know, when you think about it through that lens. So I think that's one. And then number two is just like helping us understand um, what we wouldn't build. Um, I'll let this fire truck pass. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, there are many different directions to take YouTube. So for example, one direction that people really wanted to take it was just to make it more social, right? Um, and to, you know, compete with something like Facebook or something like that. And, you know, that's a viable approach as well. But if we're really clear on what we want to do is disrupt cable, then maybe those aren't the things that you build right now. Um, so that was a, a way in which it manifested in terms of product decisions of a good north star yeah um a question from someone anonymous what do you do if a team member asks for data regarding a requirement but you don't have any to present sorry can you repeat that question again or it was what if someone is asking for data regarding some uh, sort of regarding a requirement but you don't have any to present i see um I'm wondering if this question is about whether uh, people are asking for data to justify a particular product decision, but you don't actually have the data to back that up yet. Um, so I'm gonna answer that question, but please feel free to answer a question, ask a question again if that's not the one. Um, I think that uh, a few things. One is um, sometimes, when you're, especially when you're a startup, you don't have the time to collect perfect data. Um, and, you know, when you don't have perfect data, for example, you know, you have to resort back to things that are faster to get and faster to retrieve, but maybe lower signal. And so maybe that's user research and a set of conversations with like, you know, a handful of users. And maybe if you don't even have time for that, you have, um, you know, you have principles that you might fall back on. Uh, that help you make some of these decisions. And I think it's important to evaluate first and foremost if you're in that situation where, you know, if your team kind of agrees that we need to be moving fast and not making decisions worse than, uh, and, uh, than you know, making the wrong one, then you can kind of get people in the right kind of like frame of mind. So I think that that's one strategy I employ. Um, and then the other one is, you know, I actually think that Collecting data itself is something that should be on the roadmap. And it's kind of like, you know, there's KPI work that you have to do. Even at Figma, for example, you know, what is a great experience? It's something that we're continually trying to define and we don't have a perfect metric for it yet, but it requires a lot of investment. And to make sure that you're proactively doing some of these things. And when people ask these questions, you know, create the space to do that basically, um, and not assume that there's already kind of like a perfect metric that's sitting there that's like easy to retrieve. 
Nice. Uh, curious um, from another anonymous attendee is curious about what features did we follow from Sketch? Yeah. Smiley face. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think in, in some ways this predates me, um, but definitely kind of, you know, there was a, a long period of time where a lot of users had these non-negotiables for, you know, things that they needed to see from Figma before they would be even willing to make the switch. Um, plugins was definitely one of them, um, but, you know, there are a bunch of other things as well. So there was definitely a list that we were going after. Um, you know, it's a little bit different from like the Uber Lyft world where, you know, maybe Uber Lyft were kind of at equal footing um, and trying to figure out what to do next. Whereas for the longest time, you know, uh, I think, you know, Sketch was uh, the dominant player um, and, you know, we were trying to kind of win over a lot of customers. So that strategy looked different. But so a lot of things are, are probably, yeah. Yeah. Um, Janicia has a question around what's the biggest difference between Figma's product process when you first joined, so last April, to yeah. where it is now? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, you know, this is also a function of us just becoming quite a bit bigger. Um, but, and, you know, this is also a testament to Stephanie as well, by the way. But I think a lot of it is and when I first joined at Figma, uh, there were a lot of just things happening uh, that was uh, bottoms up where people just believed it was important and were just implementing and kind of getting out, out the door. And uh, there was a little bit less work done around, you know, trying to really define what, uh, what our goals were or what stories we wanted to tell and to kind of organize it in a way that was, you know, understandable to, the, you know, to our users and to the rest of the company. And so I think that's something that I, I, I tried to kind of create in terms of, um, you know, what, are our, what is our prioritization framework? And it kind of comes back to parts of the talk as well. Uh, make sure that everyone understands that because even within a company, there's always going to be disagreement around what to, what to work on. Sales is hearing from a lot of prospective customers what they need. Support is hearing from customers and their pain points. And all of those things are valid. And if you don't have a strong prioritization framework, um, then it's really hard to rally around the company around something. And so that's something that uh, I worked a lot on um, and Stephanie has been doing as well from like this in the perspective of how we talk to our customers. Um, so I think that would be the biggest difference. Yeah, I do feel like we have a lot more conversation these days just internally before we make the final prioritizations of decisions and everyone's like really bought in and has a say and I feel like that's like step number, the most important step almost. Totally. Yeah, okay. Um, Vikram has a question around, do you have any strategies on follow-ups as in you say yes to a feature request and want to check in with the person who requested mm. it, that's a good one, or perhaps yeah. say no, how do you turn, um, turn around if that feature suddenly gets on your backlog? like that feedback. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I don't think there's a perfect way in which we do it, but, um, oftentimes when we have a feature request. Uh, in our system, we actually do try to keep reference to some of the, you know, the users who first suggested it in the first place or kind of user quotes. Uh, I just recently saw a uh, product requirement doc PRD that started with a video that one of our customers took for us of all the pain points that they had and be like, this is what we want to solve. Um, and uh, so I think we do a like semi-decent job of just, you know, uh, keeping tabs on that. And I think that's probably the most important thing. And then you can preserve the option of circling back with them if you really, uh, if you wanted to, or digging in a little bit more. Um, the other thing is, you know, um, just to re remember that there are a lot of teams that actually end up talking with customers, sales, support, and others. Um, and oftentimes as we're working through features, you know, we, we talk with them and um, ask if they know of customers that are having these pain points um, and make sure that we can get connected, whether it's in the process of figuring out what to build in the first place or whether it's in the stage of just validating whether we fix something. Yeah, I know on the marketing side, we love like at least replying to even really old tweets that like we address this finally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Doug has a question, and um, first question from him, so I want to make sure we ad address this. Can you please share a specific failure, um, how a specific failure has reshaped your team's design process or inform an update in your design philosophy? Can you think of a particular uh, failure that's reshaped your team's design yeah. philosophy? 
maybe like a lesson Ooh. learned or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that this happened in at Uber um, when, I mean, this is kind of a, a classic problem in some ways, but when we first made the rider app so that, you know, we ask for your destination first so that we can show you your price up front and your ETAs up front. Uh, one of the things that we found was that it didn't work. It didn't really work well in international markets. And the reason it didn't work well in international markets is that a lot of markets, it's actually hard to describe the destination that you're headed to because there isn't a really clean address. And, um, you know, sometimes people want to not enter that, not through, uh, not through text, but rather through the map itself. Um, and, you know, that was kind of a, a, a learning in terms of making sure that, you know, we're, we're considering some of our global markets upfront or really doing testing based on actually our user base. And it's really easy for us to sit in an office in like Silicon Valley and, uh, and use our iPhones and just kind of, you know, build an experience around that. Um, and so one of the things that we changed, at least at Uber at the time was, you know, uh, we had this policy of kind of like, uh, you had to be able to launch a, uh, a feature in the US and emerging market at the same time. Um, and that was kind of like a, a process that we changed. Uh, on the design side, we actually, you know, switched over everyone to design for Android first because it was so easy to just fall back to iPhone. Um, and so there's, there's, there's some examples of changes that we made based on, you know, some of those failures. Got it. I know it's the top of the hour, so I, I want to respect everyone's time, but maybe um, ending question, you know, we're going from one to 10 at Figma. What are you most excited about on that journey? Ooh, um, that's a really great question. I think that uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is just to continue to build uh, features that address the needs of entire teams. And it's not just, you know, just about the designers. Designers are super important. We'll continue to invest really heavily in designers, but it's also about, you know, PMs and engineers and other people in the team and making sure that they have, uh, you know, they're going to be getting a lot of value out of it too. And I think we're most successful if everyone on the team can feel really great on Figma. So I think that's some of the kind of evolution that uh, you'll be seeing over time in terms of, uh, you know, the things that we're working on. Awesome. Well, thank you, Yuki. Thank you everyone for joining and for all your great questions. And it was so great to spend our morning with you all. Yeah, thanks everyone. Talk to everyone at the next live stream. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye.